Hi, um, I'm not going to talk today. There is another talk tomorrow that I will be leading. So please join us tomorrow at half past 10 uh, in training room 22. We're talking about OpenShift uh, or Kubernetes uh, operators as well. You don't have to type the commands in. You can just click on it. So if you've even got an Android tablet, you can still do this. iOS tablet, sorry, it's not working. Uh, so I can just click on that and it will run it. So it's very simple to go through this, okay? So just read, click, and you're on. You don't have to worry about trying to copy, paste anything or enter it in by hand. Um, and that's it. Uh, this is this running on OpenShift. We've also embedded access to a web console in there uh, so that you can play around there and look at what's happening as well. Uh, the web console is not used in the workshop itself. It, all the workshop is done using command line only. Uh, but you can go through and dig through there if you want. Uh, and just a little trick, you can drag this um, left and right. Whoops, <laughs> that's a good trick. You can drag that divider left and right. Now I've mucked up all my screen uh, to make it. I'll fix that in a sec. Uh, so you can see it better. Um, but just get on with it. And in a minute, I'll just start going through it myself once I sort out my laptop and, and get this other uh, headset off. Okay, so if you came in late and uh, you want to do that, that's the URL you can go to if you actually want to do this yourself. Uh, but what I'm going to do is uh, give a bit of a, a short slide deck and then I'll go through and step through it myself. Now, Kubernetes, this is what we're demonstrating today. It's the some fundamentals of using Kubernetes, using the command line to deploy an app. You're going to go through and deploy a front-end web, web application, which is a blog site using Django, and you're going to have a back-end database, and you're going to those up together, make it visible public so that people can use it, initialize the database. And that's what the exercise is about. So Kubernetes, I um, presume you're here because you have heard of it. Now, when we get into Kubernetes, uh, your head can very, very quickly explode. It's a very complicated system when you look at the whole ecosystem and there's a big, steep learning curve. Now, one important thing to say about that is that don't expect to understand all of it. It's like a Linux operating system. You don't go to Linux expecting to be able to learn all of it. Kubernetes is the same. Uh, take the attitude that you're going to lose, learn a piece at a time as you go along, uh, because you'll never learn everything about it, okay? Uh, but what is Kubernetes and what it's all about? And what is it trying to address? Uh, so obviously containers is the big buzzword uh, in the last few years, uh, which uh, Docker, uh, made very popular because they made the idea of packaging up these applications to these things called containers and running run into an image and running them in containers very, very popular. Uh, when you look at what that technology is about, we've come from a history of having uh, a virtual idea of virtualization, which is the idea that you can run up machines, uh, multiple instances of machines within one physical machine, in each in their own little compartments. Now, containers is essentially the same basic idea, but it's intended to be a lot less overhead. Because when we talk about virtualization, we, in each of our little eyes sandboxes, are running a full operating system. When we talk about containers, we are only running th the processes of the particular application you want to run. So you don't have all that overhead of the operating system in each of your little isolated containers. You are making use of the fact that underneath your container runtime, there is just one operating system running, which is being shared across all of your containers. 
So containers are just a fancy way of putting a, a fence around a processes for your one application. Uh, and that makes it a lot more lightweight than using traditional virtualization. So the general flow of making applications run in containers is that you're going to take a set of instructions of what steps need to be run to take the bits and pieces you need for your application to build it into a package, what we call an image. Uh, it's like a glorified table. Uh, so you might say that I need to have these particular operating system packages available. Uh, I need this particular language runtime. Uh, and then you're going to need all the particular packages for that language runtime. Uh, so in our case, we're using Python application in the front end. So I have to install all the Django bits uh, for that as well, because I'm using Django Web Framework. So you're going to build that into using that set of instructions. You're going to build up your magic tarball or image. And we're going to put that up into an image registry, uh, a place essentially where we can store that and get access to it then to deploy it somewhere. So the next step is whilst we've built our image, we're going to take that image, pull it down from our image registry to a container runtime environment, and we're going to run it. And that will run up your processes inside that container. So essentially, that's what it's all about. Um, very light way of doing containerization uh, compared to virtualization, where you're just running up your own uh, application processes. Now, running a single container is quite easy. Okay, Docker made that very, very easy so that on your laptop you can just go Docker build, give it the set of instructions in the Docker file, it produces your image. You then go Docker run. Great, your app's running. The problem with that is that when you want to start scaling out your application so you have multiple instances of it, even on your own single machine or across machines so that you can distribute many instances across a big cluster of machines, that's when things get hard and problems can start to arise. If you try and do homegrown solutions yourself with Docker alone, uh, you're going to have lots and lots of problems you're going to have to solve along the way, and it's going to be a lot, a lot of work. And this is where Kubernetes comes in. Uh, Kubernetes is a, um, what's called a container as a service platform. And essentially, it's uh, providing you the smarts to be able to manage a set of machines. Uh, and now each one of those machines will have a container runtime on it where you can run up applications. And Kubernetes is going to manage for you all of those different machines. And so when I want to deploy an app now, I can tell Kubernetes, here is the image for my application which I've packaged up. I need this many instances of it running. And you tell Kubernetes. And it will worry about where to run it on which nodes in our cluster. It'll get up and running for it. It will manage them, look after it. If instances of my application die, it will replace them. It will migrate instances between nodes if it needs to because a node has gone down or it's getting uh, too much memory resources on it being used and it needs to rebalance. It can manages all those things for you. So whereas before when doing straight Docker, that would be a quite complicated process because you have to write a lot of that stuff to manage it, Kubernetes is going to manage it all for you. So that's what Kubernetes is about, and how it fits into that, that story of, of containers. So that's all I'm going to do with the slides. That just sets a little bit of context for you, uh, for those who are following, are going to follow along rather than actually doing on the, the um, uh, who, uh, who are there. <laughs> um, so I'm now going to go into the, to do the slides. Now, just very quickly for those who may have come in late, if you if you really want to do this, because it is a hands-on workshop, why am I having so much trouble with the mouse today? OK. If you really want to try and do this workshop yourself, it's a hands-on workshop, you can go to that address. Uh, you'll get a blue button come up saying start workshop. Just click on it, and you'll get to see this particular uh, workshop environment, which uh, I've got here showing here. And you'll be able to just go through and do this yourself. Everyone got that now? Who wants to do it? As I said, we're going to leave this up for a day, um, and the cluster will automatically get destroyed. Uh, so you can come back and, and do it later if need be. Yeah. How's that showing? Is that not too, too small? OK, so I already said a bit about uh, Kubernetes, so I'm going to skip some of these uh, initial slides. Um, 
So the Kubernetes cluster we're using today is actually OpenShift. So Kuber OpenShift is a distribution of Kubernetes, uh, which provides that container as a service functionality that Kubernetes provides. But it actually builds a whole lot of stuff on top as well. Now, Kubernetes is viewed as being a, a uh, more of an operations platform. Uh, op OpenShift adds on top of that extra functionality. Um, part of that is what people would call platform as a service, uh, which is an easier way of, of deploying apps. Uh, it has in there support for uh, running CI CD pipelines using Jenkins. Uh, it has support for being able to take your source code and build it into an image for you so that you don't have to worry about actually generating all the instructions and that's a thing called source to image. So it has all these extra features in there but it's still a Kubernetes distribution. Uh, so we're using it today and the exercises all you're going to do is use the kubectl command line. You're not even going to use the OpenShift specific command line. So all the things you would do here today because OpenShift is just a Kubernetes distribution, you'll be able to apply somewhere else. Um, and when you go through this environment, you've automatically got uh, access. It's all been set up for you, so you don't have to worry about that. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to deploy my whole application, my front-end application and my database, uh, and we'll see what it looks like. And we're going to destroy the front-end, and then I'm going to step through deploying that front again, front-end again, step-by-step, and we're going to explain the concepts of uh, the different components I'm going to deploy, which create my whole application so that you can see how all those things fold together. So I have uh, two, two uh, directories here, one which is containing my, uh, my database code. Um, now, when we talk about deploying apps to Kubernetes, uh, we're going to provide it with a whole bunch of configuration uh, for different things that can be deployed defined using YAML or JSON. I'm using uh, YAML today. Uh, so in this directory, I have four different config files for my database backend, which are the bits and pieces of the different components to deploy. Uh, so I've already pre-created them. So if you do have them already existing, it's actually can be very simple to then get an app deploying uh, in Kubernetes if you already got them. It's, it's creating them, which is the hard bit <laughs> in the first place. So I want to know what's going to happen when I deploy this. Now, there's a command in uh, Kubernetes, in kubectl, which kubectl apply. I essentially can give it that configuration, and it's going to take it, and it's actually going to deploy my app based on what that configuration is. So I want to see what that's going to do. Now, I, I can supply this dry run option, which says, go and pretend you're going to do this and tell me what you're going to do. So all that directory had was these four files. Each of them had uh, different resources. Um, describing what's required as a deployment, a system volume claim, a secret, and a service. Uh, but we'll get into what's inside of some of this. Um, so I did a dry run. This time I'll do it for real. Uh, I'll go and deploy that. That is gone and deployed my application uh, for the database. And if I flick over to the, the web console, we can see that is currently being deployed. So that'll just take a take a moment. Um, so back over here uh, from the command line, uh, we can also monitor the status of the rollout there. Uh, we can just use kubectl rollout status, and it will just monitor that deployment as it happens. And and once it's finished setting that up, we're done. Uh, so now we can move on. So deploying apps when you've got the config already is really simple. Um, but it's, it's it's the creating of now, we've got our front end app as well. Same thing, I have a directory which has uh, some different resource files in there. And I can uh, just deploy that one as well. And I can monitor the, the rollout of that. Now, while that's happening, uh, let's dig around in this, this console a bit more. So I've now seen I've got two deployments in my, my project or namespace. Now, when you work in Kubernetes, uh, you can, it's not just one big sand pit, uh, you can actually uh, compartmentalize applications under what's called namespaces. Uh, so that way if you've got a billing system, you might deploy that in one namespace. If you've got a web forum, you can deploy that in names another namespace and you can work with them independently. In this particular environment, 
what's actually happened when you went to that uh, start workshop, it's created each of you your own little namespace to work in and created your little account which you can then use to access it. So you're all working in the one cluster. You don't have your own cluster, you're all working in the one. And you can't see anyone else's applications that they are deploying because that namespace or project provides you a bit of isolation from everyone else. So these ones should be up. So the database is up uh, and running now and the uh, web front end as well. Now in this particular case, uh, because the resource definition has got everything we needed, it has deployed the database, we've deployed the front end. The front end and database have already been linked together, so the front end has the credential information for the database, it knows the name of it, knows how to contact it. Uh, we've given the front end and web application a uh, public URL, uh, so we can just click on that and we have our front end working. Now there's nothing Nothing currently showing there in the way of blog posts because we haven't loaded the database of anything. Now these resource files, uh, if I go back over here, um, well these resource, those files went on to create these different resources you saw there. And this, this comes where, you know, this is where the part of the, the learning curve starts with Kubernetes and, and things get very, um, very can get very complicated and messy, but everything in Kubernetes is driven by these resource definitions. Uh, essentially, they say what the st my application needs to look like, and Kubernetes essentially makes the deployment agree with what your your resources all the time. So, there's some key commands in uh, Kubernetes, uh, which is kubectl get, and another one kubectl describe, which you'll be using a lot when working with Kubernetes to find out what the state of your deployments and everything else. So we've done two deployments here. We've done our front end and our back end. So if we say kubectl get deployment, it can show us our, uh, our two deployments. We can also zoom in further and, and actually look at particular one by name. So here I'm saying I want to look at the deployment for just the blog. Uh, and if we want more information, that's when we can start to use kubectl describe and it gives you a lot, lot more information about the state of your deployment, just that one resource. If you want to get even more complicated, now we started off with a YAML file for our description. You can actually get back out that YAML file, which was loaded in, uh, and that's actually a lot more in there than what we started with, and that's because uh, when you create the deployment, you create a minimal deployment definition in yours, and Kubernetes will start filling that out with other information, be they defaults uh, for a particular deployment, uh, resource uh, resource memory and CPU based on uh, quotas that it might be, or limit range, what's called limit ranges that might be applied to your program uh, project. So it looks complicated, but what we're actually going to uh, use to create this in the first place is a lot simpler than that. And as well as the YAML, you can uh, you can get uh, JSON as well. Uh, I personally hate YAML. I always prefer using uh, JSON, um, but everyone seems to like using YAML for blog posts and documentation, so I use YAML for this. Okay. So, we have a project here which has multiple applications in it. Um, one of the big problems with Kubernetes is how do you know what belongs to what? Uh, these resources that we're creating do have names associated with them, so with the blog front end was called blog, the database was called blog-database. Uh, but it's complicated and messy to be able to deal with multiple of these resources at the same time if you have to use the names all the time. So a very key concept that exists in Kubernetes is the ability to label things. Uh, this is not just for you to be able to make queries based on your resources to get information out. Uh, those labels are also used by Kubernetes internally to draw relationships between different uh, things. So the deployment, that's just saying this is the image I need to deploy and get running in a container, but I need to access that. So we also need what's called a service, which we'll get to in a moment, and you need, you've need you got a relationship there between it. So you're going to rely on these labels. Uh, so the labels are something that when you create those resource definitions, you need to put in yourself. Uh, so you need to make sure you set them up in the right way so you can do these sorts of queries to make it easier for yourself. 
So I, can, in this case, can make a query using uh, kubectl get to get the deployment for my front-end application by using a label. Uh, and one very, very useful thing, re uh, one very, very useful uh, use of labels is deleting things. Now, I want to actually delete my front end now so we can go back and do this again. Uh, but my deployment for my front end wasn't just that deployment object, it was also a service object, an ingress object, and a persistent volume claim. And I need to delete those all at once. Now, I can delete them by name, but it's much, much easier to use these labels to delete it. So I can just run kubectl delete, deployment service ingress secret PVC, give it a label, and I've gone and deleted all of that application, it's all gone. Okay. So we can now start over, uh, and we can start looking at these things now piece by piece. I lost everyone already. How, how many is actually doing this actually in the workshop environment? Having no problems? Good. So what we're going to do now is we're going to deploy this front end in pieces. We're going to leave, the, we've left the database alone. We're going to leave that one there. Uh, we're just going to redeploy the, the front end. So what we've got starting out is this deployment uh, resource. So it's a big hunk of YAML. Uh, it has a, a name, blog. It has these labels, blog again. Uh, and inside of that is then has a, what's a template, which essentially um, defining what that deployment needs to look like. So we have a name of an image in there, which we're going to use this. For in this case, it's uh, this OpenShift Catacoda blog Django Pi. So that is the image I would have built previously from my Docker file. Uh, so it has all the bits of my application in it, my runtime and everything in there. And that's sitting up on a, on a registry. In this case, it's sitting up on a, a registry called Docker Hub. Uh, and that image is out on the internet. And I want to deploy that. So my deployment says, that's the image I want to deploy. Uh, I'm saying that it exposes a or uses a port 8080 for being able to access it for my web traffic. I need to set some environment variables uh, for the um, where the database is, uh, credentials for database and other bits and pieces. I have a volume definition there because I need persistent storage. So that has all those bits and pieces in there. Um, now, in this case, you know, I've created that, I knew how to create that. If you're coming along and have never used Kubernetes before, what most people do is they'll go find some article or documentation and go, oh, I'll just cut and paste this, I'll change the image name and, and then use it and hope it works. That's, honestly, that is actually how most people would be doing this. Um, Kubernetes does provide you a little bit of assistance, but not much on being able to create these deployment objects. Uh, and they have two commands for this. Uh, this first one called kubectl create deployment. And essentially you can give that the name of your image uh, that you want to run. And it gives you a starting point. Now, unfortunately that's not really complete. Um, like there's no port in there. How do, how do I do that? There's no environment variables. Uh, there is another one which can get you slightly further, uh, which is kubectl run blog. And if I run that one, you can see I can get a bit more information. So I can define a port. I can set up an environment variable. I can uh, say how many instances of my application, how number of replicas I need. So you can use those to sort of create a skeleton where you can start out with. But to be honest, you can't avoid in Kubernetes having to drop down and start playing with YAML or JSON files to deploy your application. And that's, again, where that learning curve gets very steep very quickly. Um, but we'll start out with this second one uh, as a starting point, And we will try and add bits and pieces to it. So I've already uh, taken that, that one there from that kubectl run. I've dumped it in a, a, a file in my, my directory here. And I'm going to, um, again, use my kubectl apply. Now, you can just use kubectl apply and give it a single file. It's actually possible to have one file which has a whole list of resources in there. And you can have everything in one file. Now I've used a different strategy here, which is to have a directory where each of my resources is a separate file. Uh, there's different ways you can approach this. You can, you can go to that and there's a link in, in the, the notes there off to where there's a um, discussion 
on the Kubernetes documentation about the different ways you can do things. Because uh, with that kubectl run command, I, I did a dry run option just to see what it would create. If I left that dry run option off, it would actually go and create that resource in Kubernetes and actually get my image deployed. And that's what's called an imperative command. Essentially, you're making an action, essentially telling it what to do this, and it's going, going to do it. Uh, the problem with that is that when you do it, the only record of your configuration exists in Kubernetes. Uh, so if I want to make changes, I have to then go edit in Kubernetes. Now, you can do that as a kubectl edit command, which allows you to edit. Uh, but how then do I reproduce that on another cluster? Um, you sort of like got to extract it and move it out. And that can be a bit of a problem moving configuration from one cluster to another. So the much better way is to always capture um, your configurations in a file, in the file system, get it under version control so that you can track it. So that's what I've done here. I've got a directory in there uh, with my files in it, and I'm going to have one uh, file per resource instead of one with lots in it. Uh, so I can just then see go kube, cut it, apply, give it the directory, and it will go and, and deploy that. Uh, so I'll have that uh, deployment now popping up over here again. But it's just a deployment. I'm missing my other bits. So let's uh, let's um, move on to those. So that's, that's running. So I've got my image, my application deployed. It's running in a container. It's just not terribly useful yet because I can't access it. Um, but let's have a look at the what's happened here first. So let's lose our kubectl get command, um, and we're going to list there. Now, I created a deployment resource, but you'll actually see that there's actually been a lot of other things created in there. It's also created uh, what's called a replica set and some pods. Now, what that deployment object actually is, is it acts as a template. Uh, so when I create the deployment, it's acting as a template for the creation of the replica set. The replica set is in turn acting as a template for the pods. Now, you remember I created that deployment initially saying I wanted two replicas. So the two things you have here is the pods. The pods represent the instances of your application. Uh, so I have my two instances there. The replica set is like a, um, it's like a little bookkeeping management thing in, in some respects. Uh, it's, it's there to drive some of the uh, mechanisms inside of Kubernetes which manage pods. So from that replica set, Kubernetes will monitor replica sets. It's from that can see, oh, you want to actually deploy that application, how many instances, and it will then manage the number of pods. It'll ensure you've got two replicas running. Um, so there's some magic little things going on there internally. Um, but I, I won't go into it too much. It's just to sort of get you the idea that these things are happening. Um, so yeah, so I look in there. If you if you did look at the replica set, you'll see that there's a lot of overlap there with what what was in the deployment. And I said that's because it's acting as this this uh, the deployment is acting as a template for the replica set. And and similarly, I can look for at each pod, uh, and I'm just looking at oh yeah, I've got both here. Same thing. It's you'll see a lot of overlap because the information has flowed through. So a pod represents an instance of your application. The replica set is essentially a a configuration, a synthetic, synthesized one which Kubernetes used to know it has to monitor your application and keep how many instances running all the time. So one of the things here is in that deployment, uh, we set the number of replicas now, and that's why we ended up with number two, we ended up with two. So you can, one of the, the good things about Kubernetes is that scaling apps is really, really simple. Uh, it is purely just that number in there which controls the number of instances I've got. Uh, I don't have to go and create new resource definitions for each instance. That deployment replica set pods, that flow means I just all I need to do to scale up an application is change that number of replicas. So we can do that. So I can run this command, Kubernetes scale deployment replicas, and, and it is going to start up a new one. And you'll see how it's starting up my new instance there in a new container. So if I keep doing this command, I'm, I'm now up and running. 
Now, I haven't had to make any decisions there about where that instance runs. Uh, we're running a cluster here with 20 nodes because, frankly, we had no, how ma no idea how many people were going to turn up. I asked the organizers, how big is the room you've given us? Uh, uh, two or three hundred people. And we had no idea how big the conference was. So we, we created a really big cluster, uh, much bigger than we needed. Um, but I didn't have to make a decision about where that ran that. Kubernetes knows I want free replicas, so it will look at uh, what requirements my application may need if I've defined it in terms of how much memory and CPU it needs. And it will look at what resources are available in that cluster. And it will go, OK, I've got a node over here in my cluster which has got lots of resources available. I'll go and start it over there. And you don't have to worry about it. Um, now, when I ran this kubectl scale deployment or scale command, I was modifying the deployment resource definition inside Kubernetes. Now, you remember what I mentioned before about the difference between making edits in Kubernetes and keeping them in files? My local configuration is now out of sync with what is in the cluster. Uh, and this is where keeping your files is good because uh, if someone does a mistake like that, you do need to bring it back to what it was before. I can actually go back and run the exact same command I run before to deploy it and say, kubectl apply again. Here's my directory of files. Kubernetes will see, oh, actually, you want to go back to that. And it will go and do what I essentially bring the state of the cluster, my application in the cluster, back to agree with what my configuration said. So it's already scaled that back down to two. Because my resource file, which I'd used, only had two in it. I scaled up to three manually. I reapplied the config to put it back to two. So this is why it's important. It gives you that ability to reproduce your deployments. So always use the config files in your version control rather than trying to make manual changes. Like manual changes in Kubernetes is fine in development, uh, but for production and the ability to redeploy things, always use config files. OK. Now, I mentioned a bit about uh, Kubernetes making decisions about where to run things. And one of the things I mentioned earlier was the fact that if an instance of my application will die, Kubernetes knows how many I want. So it will take care of ensuring I already have, always have that number. So I'm, I'm watching here the, uh, the pods I have there uh, running already for my instances. So if I actually go and delete one, you'll see that my pod is terminating. And Kubernetes realizes, oh, one of my instance applications has died. So it will go, oh, you actually wanted two. We're down to one now. So it will go and create a new one for me. Uh, and so it'll always ensure that it has those two rare running if your application starts crashing. And again, it will make a, a decision about where to put that and actually may migrate that to a different node if the resource balance has changed. So I went for pods containers. So essentially, the pod is the instance um, inside a pod. Uh, the pod is actually as a wrapper around a container. Uh, so we started off with containers. Pod essentially is an abstraction inside of Kubernetes to wrap one or more containers. Because when we were doing that scaling, the number of replicas, what the, the scaling unit is the pod. So I could have a grouping of multiple containers. Uh, but when I scale it, they're all going to get scaled together. Now, I had a database and a front end. Uh, I have them as separate deployments. I'm not running them as different containers within the one pod or group, because I need to be able to scale them independently. Okay. Usually, you're going to end up with one container per pod. There are use cases for having more than one container grouped in a pod together. Uh, and one example of that is things called uh, sidecar containers. Uh, if you needed to add in a special process for handling instrumentation for collection of metrics and so on, you might use that. But usually, it's one container per pod. So the relationship now is container, is wrapped by a pod. The pod is managed by the replica set. The definition of the replica set was controlled by the deployment. So that's the relationship. Uh, so the node, when I talk about it in the cluster, it uh, can be a physical machine or it can be 
essentially it's an instance of an operating system, right? So it can be deployed to physical hardware or could be deployed in a virtual machine uh, in a virtualized environment. You, you can do either. Uh, so I have all these pods. Now, you need to know what these pods are doing. Uh, so it is possible to uh, get the logs out. So you just need to know the name of the pod. Um, and I've just done a funny, horrible script here to get the name of the pod out. So I've got a, a name of one pod, and I can look at the logs for that. And we see that it's a, a Django application using ModWhiskey. Uh, everyone thinks ModWhiskey is great if you're a Python developer. No, I wrote that one. Pity. Um, so you can get logs out. Um, by default, it's like Docker. You have to go to every pod to get the separate uh, logs out. Uh, but it is possible to deploy to a Kubernetes cluster what's called aggregated logging, uh, which can bring the logs for all these different uh, pods together into a, a, a common application. And uh, one solution for that often is, uh, uh, I'm going to get this wrong, Elasticsearch, FluentD, Kibana. A uh, combination of those tools, but there are other options as well. Uh, and usually that, or sometimes that can be integrated into the, the web console. Uh, in, with OpenShift, that is the case, so you can very easily get to that old aggregated logging mechanism. Now, we get to logging. Now, each of these pods is actually it's like a little mini host, and it is actually possible to get into them if you need to interact with the processes in that app. Uh, so I can run a, a kubectl exec command. Uh, and run command in there to show my environment. Uh, that one obviously exits straight away, but I could actually also get in there and run an instance of bash and get in there and w run whatever commands I want. Uh, you know, look at the files, I can interact with the file system, I can look at the processes. Uh, I could be nasty and kill processes. <laughs> um, but obviously if you, if you kill that special one at the top, number one, your container will exit. Uh, but then Kubernetes will restart it for you. So it's not too bad. Now, so we have our instance of application. We can get into them. We can see logging. But we still can't access them. Now, each one of those pods, it, I said it acts like a little host. Now, each pod does get its own IP address. That IP address is only accessible inside of the Kubernetes cluster, uh, not outside. Uh, but dealing with IP addresses, when communicating between components of an application is a pain in the neck. You don't know what these IP addresses are in advance. And if a pod gets killed and replaced, it gets another different IP address. Things will change all the time. So Kubernetes has this idea of a service resource which you can create. Now, if I run this command, am I still inside? Oh, OK, I thought I pressed exit. Um, you'll see each has a different IP address. Now, when you have multiple instances, I want to be able to talk to these via one IP address uh, rather than multiple. So this service, we have a service idea of a service abstraction. And you can see it up there. Uh, essentially, I'm creating a service called blog. Uh, has a label again. And then it has this definition here that I'm going to create a, a, a service. The service has its own IP address. It has port 8080. And what's going to happen is it's going to map uh, any connections to port 8080 on its IP address and route that through automatically to one of the instances of my pod for me, where which pods are used is, is determined by this selector. And that's where I mentioned before about labels being very important. Um, so I can apply this, and it, it creates me a service. Uh, I have a service. The service has its own IP address. And I can, uh, I mentioned the, the label. So that selector in there at blog, essentially it's the same as looking up the pods by that label selector. Those are the things will get mapped behind that service. I can actually look specifically at which ones are mapped uh, by looking at what's the, called the endpoints. Uh, and it will show me the, the two IP addresses for the pods. And they are mapped now behind that IP address for the service. Again, it's still an IP address. They're a pain to deal with. Uh, so the name of that service is added into an internal DNS server inside of the Kubernetes cluster. So I can access that using a host name of blog. I, I don't need to use the IP address. Uh, so if I need to access it internally, I, if I'm in the same namespace, I can just say blog host name. 
or if I need to access it from another namespace or have it that ability, I can uh, use blog namespace name service and port. And so you know, I can then curl that. So I can access it. But I'm accessing this because I, my terminal is running in the cluster. I'm not outside still yet. So this is still not public. So we can now expose that. Uh, and to do that, we use what's called an ingress, uh, essentially saying, here's the host name I want to make this thing available outside of my cluster as. Uh, and this is the name of the service, which I want the, that request to be mapped into. And obviously, then the service has a mapping to the pods. So what will happen now is the request will come in from outside, uh, hit the router, which is configured with this ingress, and it will then distribute that, will send that traffic to one of the instances of the pods. So I can apply that. I now have an ingress created, and we can see that that's the host name that was created. Now, internally to the cluster, my service and pods were listening on port 8080. Now, outside of the cluster, using non-standard ports is not real good, but the router is smart enough and the way Ingress is set up is that externally people will be using port 80, so standard port, and the router maps that through automatically to port 8080 internally. Uh, so that does it all for me. Um, one very important thing, uh, don't show here, is remember how we deleted our instances of our pod earlier and it created a new one? It got a different IP address. Kubernetes will worry all about that. If when I delete a pod and it comes up with a, a new IP address, the old pod is automatically removed from the list of endpoints from the service and from the pods that the router is sending traffic to. And it will automatically add that IP address back into the service for the new one and again for the ingress. So it worries about reconfiguring the internal network from the service and the router for you. And you don't have to worry about it. So I've got that app up running now and I can uh, go visit it again. Uh, this time I happen to have some data. And that's only because I'm not using my real database yet. This is using an internal test database when I deploy it without a real database. Ten minutes. So to link the database, uh, we need to set some environment variables. So, so that was our resources for our database. Um, so you know, hopefully now, now with deployment and, and services, we have a couple of others of persistent volume and secret. Uh, and I can see that on my deployment for my blog, I currently have one environment variable. Now, I want to set some others in there for the name of the host of the database. Now, we know from the, what I said before about a service name acts as a host name for my database internally. Uh, so my, my host name for my database is going to be blog-db. I need this via user password and database name. So I need to set those. Um, So Kubernetes has a command, a, a kubectl uh, set n, which does allow me to set environment variables. Uh, and that's OK for setting one environment variable uh, for the host, and I can do that. Um, and essentially, if you look at the definition, what it's doing is just filling in some extra fields in my YAML. Uh, but for the credentials for the database, I actually have them stored in what's called a secret. Uh, this is a way of putting information and storing the configuration for that as part of um, the Kubernetes. Now, the database is already using those. I want to reuse those in my front end. I don't want to have to enter them in separately. That way I can keep them in one spot. So the, the kubectl set env command has a way of essentially setting up the definition uh, of my YAML to say, hey, I need to set these environment variables, but use them from this secret so I'm not creating them separately. Uh, so secrets is a way of storing configuration. There's another thing in, in Kubernetes called a config map, which I don't go into here, which is very similar. Secrets is uh, essentially the same as config map, but just provides some extra guarantees around about how information is saved in the cluster. It's never saved to disk, for example, in a secret, uh, on a node, at least. Um, so from those, I can update my uh, YAML definition, um, adding my extra host and also using it from the secret for the other credentials. And again, I can just apply that. I've now linked my front end to my database. Now, when I'm making changes like this to the um, environment variables, uh, Kubernetes is smart enough to know that's a configuration change and is redeploying my pods for me. So it's deleting the old ones and bringing up new instances. Uh, and it's doing that all for me. 
that's linked together. Um, now, whoever, if you're familiar with Django, you'll know that uh, right, it will can auto configure the data, configure the database for me. But I need to set a credential, and that's where I can uh, use the fact that I can exec into a pod uh, to do a command. And I'm going to have a little magic shell script here, which is going to do some things for me. It's going to check my migration is happening, and I can go and uh, add my credentials in. So I've set up a uh, yeah, set up that, and that'll actually also preloaded some content in my real database now as well. So I have everything going. Now, one final thing, and we've got five minutes left, which is excellent. Um, this particular web application is storing blog post information in the database, so it's giving persistence for that now. Uh, but I also need to store images for images uploaded with blog posts. Now, for that, I need persistent storage. Uh, so what we can do here, Kubernetes supports the concept of persistent volumes. So you can have a whole bunch of storage available, and you can make what's called a persistent volume claim. Uh, that essentially says that I need storage uh, of a particular size, a particular type, and I need it for my application. So it supports a number of different types of storage uh, or access modes. Uh, depending on whether you need storage which can be mounted on multiple nodes in a cluster at the same time, um, which is file like file system storage. Or with a database, for example, we only have a one instance, so we know we can get away with uh, a type of storage that only needs or only could be uh, mounted on one node at a time, say elastic block storage in Amazon, for example. So you can describe the characteristics of the storage you need by your YAML definition. And uh, we could create that, and essentially it's then Kubernetes will say, okay, I've allocated you some storage, but I still need to actually mount that in my application. So I need to go back to my original deployment now and add actually a couple of uh, extra bits of information. And, and that is the first one is that this deployment is going to need that persistent volume claim that was just created, uh, that persistent storage. And I need to go into each of the definitions for the container in that pod described in the deployment and say I want to mount that persistent volume at this directory inside of that container. Um, so again, updating my original YAML file on disk, I've added those there at the bottom. I can apply those and I now have deployment, ingress, persistent volume and service block and we're back now to what we had when I deployed it in all in one go. Uh, so if I were to go back to um, my blog now, set my, my password, my uh, access to the database, I could log into it, I could create posts, I could upload images, uh, the images are stored on disk, the post in the database, uh, if any of my instances in my application die, they'll get restarted elsewhere uh, and they'll be already connected to the database. Uh, when your pod gets moved from one node to another, Kubernetes will worry about moving the storage, the persistent volume mount with it. Uh, so it will handle that all for you and, and you don't have to worry about it. Um, so that was it. If you're working through that, there are some uh, links at the end uh, for uh, finding information about OpenShift, which is the cluster uh, we were using here, using Kubernetes. Uh, so OpenShift is, is OKD, which is the open source upstream project, which is uh, used um, goes into OpenShift. So OpenShift obviously is a, a product from Red Hat and, and OKD is the open source upstream project that feeds into that. If you want to run OpenShift on your own uh, laptop, there is a, a project called MiniShift which you can use uh, or if you want to actually deploy a full cluster on your own hard, oh, up on Amazon, uh, we have try.openshift.com at the moment is where you can go and try the very latest version of OpenShift which you're going to be releasing down the track soon. Uh, which is OpenShift 4. And there's some links there to Kubernetes. And a final one at the bottom, which is a good site, which is kubernetesbyexample.com, which you can uh, uh, go there and it provides you, again, it goes through all of different resource types, explains a bit about them, uh, different examples of how to use them and so on. And that's it. That's the end of the workshop. So if you have any If you are still awake. Yes, if still uh, I took a nap while he was talking.
So questions? Uh, one container in one pod and that is, uh, that's what is preferred. So if you want to put multiple containers in a pod, then I should have a single deployment YAML with the different configuration, is it? How so does it work? So you, you can put multiple containers in a pod, but think about this as an example. Okay. We had a front end and a database. Yeah. If we ran the front end in one container and a database in another container of the same pod, I can't scale that up mm -hmm. because you can't just take a database like Postgres and say, oh, I want 10 instances now. It's not that simple. Uh, so most of the time you prefer having one container to pod because then you can scale up the number of replicas separately. Mm. Okay? okay? But they said there are some use cases, um, sidecar containers, and like this workshop environment is an example where I'm actually using multiple containers. Uh, the terminal and the content were running in, um, from an application running in one container that embedded console in there was running in a separate container of the same pod. But purely that's because it was convenient in the way that I'm running up stuff for this environment. Um, okay. So does that answer the question? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Uh, one more question. Okay. <laughs> I thought you were throwing the real microphone for a minute. <laughs> hey. Does, does the shaking when you throw it turn it on? <laughs> no. Okay. I, why? Okay. So, um, my question is actually with regards to the workshop. Um, is the code available for the for the workshop, or uh, it will be gone after the day, as you mentioned? Okay. So this particular cluster that we're doing the workshop in, um, that will we'll leave that running until tomorrow because it's just it, it's scheduled to be deleted about ten or eleven o'clock tomorrow. morning. So we leave it running. So you can get access to it. So if you want to try again, you can do it now. Are you asking about the ability workshop to do itself, it again yeah. or the actual the workshop itself. the workshop content itself? Yes. It is up on a GitHub repo. Okay. Um, but right now, because we've been developing this workshop environment over the last few months to get it all nice and polished, the documentation isn't really there for you to go and deploy it yourself. Uh, but it does require you have OpenShift to deploy it into. Right? Technically, I probably could get it going in plain Kubernetes, but I haven't done that yet. Uh, that's easy enough for me, yeah. yeah. I, I'll probably yeah, catch you talk up. after. But uh, we, will, we will probably try to post them. If you follow him on Twitter, we will try to post the, the instructions with the uh, Fos Asia uh, Twitter handle so anyone uh, can, can follow it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Okay, uh, I think we are running out of time. Uh, okay, uh, so next thing is uh, group photo going to be taken here. I think uh, Michael is setting up things. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Graham and Joe. Please uh, put your hand together for them.